Hey folks, uh, thanks. We're going to start now. Uh, welcome to the 159th monthly meeting of the New York Linux User Group. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Kapil Pembelu, uh, who will be introducing us to Canonical's new service orchestration configuration manager tool, Juju. Uh, tonight, before we get started, a uh, couple of requests that we make every time. Uh, first, uh, good, good opportunity to, to silence your cell phones if you haven't done that already. Uh, secondly, there's some cool coffee machines in the back, but they're extremely loud, so uh, if we could put the coffee up until after, that'd be great. And uh, also, if you have any questions at any time, raise your hand, somebody will come over with a mic, and uh, uh, we'll go with that. Uh, we'd also like to take time to thank our sponsors at Google for graciously allowing us to use this um, fantastic space. And we'd like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media. And the many I love the volunteers who contributed to the organization over the years. If you'd like to reach out to the leadership team at NILOG, feel free to grab myself or any other NILOG officer, or email us at NILOG.org. Um, I think, oh, excuse me, at NILOG.org. If you'd like to uh, also feel free to visit the website, www.nilog.org. Uh, for more info, our mailing list, IRC chat, etc. After Kapil gives his talk, uh, we'll have a few trivia questions on Juju, so pay attention. They should be the, the answers will be in the in the talk. Um, we'll be giving away three free ebooks from O'Reilly. And uh, after that, uh, please join us for, for more talk and some drinks over at McKenna's Pub, which is uh, right nearby 250 West 14th Street. And uh, I believe there may be some additional announcements. Brian, do you have something? Sure. Um, this month, uh, there's a, a free Drupal event. It's from the 19th to the 23rd. It's, um, it, the website is nyccamp.org. And um, next <coughs> Wednesday, uh, their puppet user group is having like a DevOps drink up. Anybody's free to come. Um, there's, it's, it's on Meetup. Up at NYC. Uh, also, uh, if anybody has a video camera that has a in, uh, external microphone input, we've, we we've been the sound of, on our current camera isn't that great. And, that and then Rob, uh, Rob, do you want to make an estimate of the next action? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, Tuesday. We have a Nylog Hack Workshop at the New York Public Library Hudson Branch, which is at 66 Leeward Street. And the structure of the workshop is basically come and teach, and we teach you. And the subjects that we cover range from beginning Linux, programming, hardware hacking. Generally, it's a free for all. Come in, teach what you'd like to teach, learn what you'd like to learn. There's no real limit to what we teach. There's always somebody there who's willing to you know, share information with you. And if you'd like to find out more information, um, look on our website at nylog.org or find out on meetup.com. They're always announced every two weeks when they're about to arrive. And <clears throat> also like to mention too that, um, actually, no. Okay, yeah, that's all actually. I, all right, thanks, Carl. And uh, with that, deal. <coughs> Let's uh, we'll hear about you here. Hi folks, um, my name is Kapil. Um, I work at Conical. I've been working on the server team for about three years. I live in DC and took the both us up um, to, to talk to you guys today. And um, I'm currently the tech lead engineering manager around um, things related to Juju. Um, but I've been around since Juju's early days and feel free to ask questions. Okay, so what is Juju? Um, Juju is a service orchestration tool for cloud and data centers for uh, working at scale of awesome machines. Uh, service orchestration is kind of a nebulous term, so I'm going to take a step back and try to go from ground up. It's a little bit cheesy, it works for me. It works for me. Uh, the old style of management, you'd uh, get some machines, you build them yourself, you buy them, you rack and stack them, you know, take some care of them and plugging in the network cards and switch and you know, get them some attention and get started getting some attention from them and get new names. And you love them, you know, you know 
which ones you know all about their habits and all the eccentricities. And you start to use them, and so you put the fit files on them, and you say you connect your database server to your web server, and the IP addresses in the fit files. But and that topology was stored in your, uh, the, how the services were put together um, was stored in your head. And there were a couple of issues though. You know, say you had a successful business, uh, it became harder to manage. You start having lots more machines, and it's hard to give them names, hard to find them. Where was that plugging the switch? And sometimes they just went away. Hard drive and the apologies got really complicated. So the question is that Juju tries to, to, to solve is how to try to manage these well, mm -hmm. debris machines at, at a larger scale um, with reuse mm -hmm. and collaboration around knowledge and like best practices around the service. So Juju is managing services, not machines. Uh, at, if you have a hundred or a thousand or two thousand or a hundred thousand, you don't necessarily care about the individual performance of the machine, you care about the overall throughput and aggregate performance of the service. Um, to do is different than configuration management, it incorporates provisioning directly into the tool itself. So the tool will allocate machines and resources directly to the cloud service. And it promotes and enables service definition in a reusable context point fashion, as well as management of service. So just to take out a more concrete example, um, let's say uh, we're trying to install Hadoop. Now Hadoop has several different components, um, multi-page install. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, got some ideas, so some, perhaps some of you have already uh, played with that uh, before. But if I was trying to install Hadoop on my range of machines, it would take time. Slave, and it will deploy five machines of that. And 
that will be allocated to whatever the defaults are set up to for the environment configuration. So after we deploy them, they don't really do anything. They just are sort of sitting there. So we add a relation to them so that they will, um, the appropriate events will fire, and the charms will respond to that and actually open up the, the various uh, connections between the two services and modify the configuration so that we actually have a working system. <coughs> what node are you running these commands on? Uh, I'm running these from the client. So the, all the junior commands will run from whatever client you might want. So the client, in this case, might be my laptop. Um, and they are acting against that. When we did that initial bootstrap in the environment, so it's like that rest of the, the API endpoint for the client. And then the, that, uh, <coughs> we call it sort of a bootstrap node. That bootstrap node will then be able to affect all the changes within the environment that we specify. So in this case, um, we are going to go ahead and add a relation, uh, which will we're basically setting up our, our name node and our HDFS data nodes. Um, and then we'll go ahead and we set up a, uh, our MapReduce system for the job tracker and the test tracker. For the yeah. And this will actually go ahead and configure all the actual files and all the connections, point all, all the addresses, um, and configure it as, as necessary. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, but now let's say I've got a big map reduce job and I need to add some additional capacity. Well, it makes it really easy to scale any individual service just by running a command called add unit. And you could also specify add unit 20 or 2000. Um, we've tested this up to 2000 nodes on AWS, and most of that's just a limitation of requesting capacity for Amazon. <coughs> you brought down Netflix. Yeah, you have to basically call your representative or your service account representative and ask them how many units can I get in my data center and I don't want to use spot pricing or whatever you know, your constraints are. Um, and of course, they don't rate limits here on your API usage, so it takes some additional time. Uh, so that's enough, I guess, to enjoy it hopefully. But I'll try to hopefully we come more fair with some more details. Um, but so, first, a quick architecture diagram. Um, this diagram is Um, so hopefully that's somewhat readable. Um, this diagram is a bit old. Uh, it um, did it in, before before JJ was uh, uh, called JJ. It was previously known as a project called Ensemble, and uh, this diagram was written back when they had that. And so and the names have been so updated, but the architecture is roughly the same. So um, so you get command line client. When you do GG Bootstrap, it sets up inside of the um, machine provider, the environment, a Zookeeper server, uh, which we use as a, as a primary database, as well as um, some provisioning, some agents there, um, in this case, the provisioning agent, um, which allocates on subsequent deploys of charms and services to the machine providers. And we have several different machine providers, uh, EC2, LC, OpenStack, um, Mass, which I'll, I'll get into a little more detail later. And when we uh, deploy a charm, we have a charm repository, which can be the local one on your disk, or we have the um, what we call the charm store, which has all of the sort of QA and review charms that are available to the user. And when you deploy a charm, it goes ahead and modifies the user, which uh, tells it that the charm is deployed. For it and upload the charm to um, what we call the provider storage. Um, in EC2, it would be S3, and OpenStack would be Swift, and inside of a uh, local provider, and now see the provider on the local laptop, which is for development, it would be uh, just a local uh, S3, uh, website. Then that machine gets uh, allocated, and we use something called Cloudinet, uh, which is uh, available for M2, uh, WM, and uh, Red Hat, which allows for sort of the initial um, boot configuration and installation via a very simple YAML format, uh, which usually uses the to initialize the machines. Um, and via that initialization, it gets, it, Juju to, gets the machine to install Juju and to run uh, an agent, a machine agent. And that machine agent will see that there's a service that's been allocated to that machine goes ahead and downloads the charm and starts up what's called a service unit agent. Uh, and that service unit agent is going to go ahead and retrieve the 
uh, go ahead and execute all of the uh, necessary lifecycle hooks from the charm. Um, it's important, uh, okay. an important uh, distinction for how we do our service definitions is that we're done in a language neutral and, and tool neutral way. Um, and you can quickly be a native to it. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then when we do a service relation, um, we had a relationship between these two services. We again modify Zookeeper. Um, the agents all become aware of that and um, go ahead and execute the relevant bits out of their respective chunks. Okay. So here is an example uh, uh, environment configuration file. Um, when you run JD the first time, just by itself, it'll go ahead and create a default one for you uh, if you want to set up. I've got two environments to select here. Um, I've got a uh, what's called a local provider, which is actually runs on my local laptop. So and it uses LC, which is a very lightweight container <coughs> level, uh, OS level uh, namespacing um, to allow for me to move this. So it's very lightweight, like three five percent overhead versus something like VirtualBox, which is full. Instead of saying it's as full virtualization, they're effectively just you know, processes and chamber with uh, namespace to get. So it's very likely um, if you run you know, 10 dozen of these on your laptop, uh, we'll have a lot of again. And um, so I specify a local provider, and I specify as my dev environment, and then I specify EC2 as my uh, prod environment, and there's some additional metadata here for EC2, um, my control bucket in S3, which sort of, I, know, I put all the charms in when I'm deploying them, um, some an admin secret, which gets initialized in Zookeeper, and I'm specifying which release of the distribution I want to actually use, it, as well as which. Uh, and there's some additional configuration that is that is uh, documented on the GGA uh, website. So, what's the new ID service keys that each vendor itself Um, Those, sorry, those are unique items? Yes, they're, they're mostly used to identify the client as well as to, to give the client a place to know how to connect to the different environment. So I could, um, so the, the, the secret, and the, so the control bucket is really to help the client know exactly where within EC2 to go to, which machines do I actually need to talk to. Um, and so primarily the, uh, both of these environment specifications, just a simple YAML file, are, are really all about trying to Point the client to where where that risk that the API point is, and of course to identify. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so the other thing is that you know um, the <laughs> can't step outside the circle. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty straightforward as far as it means. And you can, of course, specify, I'm uh, specifying on the top of this file the default um, environment that I want to connect to. Um, if I don't want to specify to a non default one, I can specify either an environment variable on a command line, or I can uh, specify via command line switch. And, of course, I can have, if I want to, I can have 10 different environments with that single easy to region or location. I'm just calling that by name. So this is a this is what an actual charm looks like. Um, this is a very simple charm. It's called it's called that thing. Um, the charms themselves again can be written in any language. Um, you basically specify some basic metadata um, in the animal format. And then as far as how can you actually do it in any language, um, but back to those two examples. Inside of this hooks directory, I have some hooks install, start, stop, which are basically just executables that you can uh, write in any language, use any tools that you want. Um, and Juju will basically execute them at various lifecycle points to, <coughs> for them to actually do their work. So to look at, so the way for file for a term is metadata handled. 
case it tells you to what it is that this charm can do, um, as well as gives some descriptive metadata for when you're looking around for new charms. So here is the contents of the media wiki. So we down a little bit just to get the present nicely. Um, it specifies what this charm requires. Um, uh, and the uh, so it requires a database of type MySQL. You can also use a slave database of type MySQL. And it can use a cache of type memcache. And it provides a uh, a HTTP endpoint. And so with that, um, you can you can add. so the, the actual relationships are sort of the secret sauce of here, how it actually connects with this piece together. Are DB slave and cache reserved keywords here, or that you define them somewhere else? The, so the actual names around DB slave and cache are really specific to the term. I can name whatever I want here. The interface name is actually the, the type of that relationship. It defines a communication protocol. The relations of cells form. Uh, uh, okay, well, 200, 200, uh, several slides away. Um, oh, wait, that's but, um, and so that, that's sort of important. It's pretty simple as far as what it is. It, um, it, there's not much to it as far as what you have to do. And it's a little hard to consider. Um, as far as this char particular charm defines some configuration options that the user can set at runtime um, or at flow time. Um, and you can specify again another config. This is a the config.yaml file. And you specify what the different variables are for this charm that you can set. What the type are, what the type is, as well as some description metadata and default value. So again, the hooks are these names that are called out of types like both that handlers. Uh, as far as how the hooks interact back with Juju, <coughs> Juju provides if, uh, its own CLI API for these hooks to be able to get metadata out of Juju as well as to set values back into Juju. And as far as what all the hooks are, um, these are sort of the base lifecycle hooks. You get the install hook, start, stop, um, whenever the configuration changes, um, as well as whenever you upgrade the charm itself. So all the charms are version to end, you can upgrade a charm and have this code called out to upgrade databases, et cetera. Now, the relationships are, again, secret sauce of Juju. They're basically bi directional communication channels. Um, they have sort of, these, these are what we use for these to allow for things to connect together, get their IP information um, for each other, so that their databases, and it's, it's not ever a, get a steady state per se. You have the relationships, um, you can play tic-tac-toe with that kind of relationship if you want to. Um, and as far as what you types of relationships that you provides for out of the box are client and server relationships, mm -hmm. as well as peer relationships, which are a little bit more common with some of the NoSQL databases some sort of uh, consistent hashing or rendering, for example. Um, and again, all relationships were typed by name convention. There's not actually a defined protocol per se um, around any given relationship. It's still out for easy iteration and development around, around these things. But there, instead, um, the name itself specifies the, how what that protocol is. Uh, as far as what the, so the relationships also have set points. And those hooks relate to um, seeing membership and, and settings of the other side of the relationship. So whenever, um, if I have a, um, a front end load balancer connected to a bunch of web applications, for example, on the backend, whenever the, and I create a relationship between them, anytime I add up a new app server, the load balancer will go ahead and we will see a, a join event, which will execute its join hook for that relationship. And it can go ahead and add, get the settings for the app server, primarily its IP address and, and the port that it's using, and go ahead and add it to the rotation. Um, we use properties of Juju, uh, sorry, of Zookeeper here. Zookeeper gives us some basic presence information that allows us to uh, detect if you know, there's a network split or something dies. Then we'll also get a, a department so that the load balancer can immediately take it out of rotation. This is sort of a live connected model that these are this is not a polling based system, so we have sort of direct knowledge of things as they're happening. And if it comes back that, for example, it comes back up, then um, 
on the, uh, the executed again, and we can see it the day because I don't have the rotation. Um, each side of the relation um, has its own settings. Every single service unit, um, every single machine that's running a service has its own, its own ability to set its own settings in the relationship. And anytime that changes, so say, in my service unit A1, it, set, it changes its settings. Both A1 and B2 will have um, change hooks executed against that service unit, which will allow them to, to see what their change of values, change of values was. And they can also set their own changes, their own settings, and modify them. And then the other side, let's see, all the other, all the units on the other side, A1 through A4, would have their change hooks executed for the relevant changes on the other side. Um, so we talk about service orchestration, and service orchestration sometimes implies to people that there's some sort of magical orchestrator process. Um, that's not really how Juju takes approaches to orchestration. Juju approaches orchestration in a very sort of peer-to-peer -peer fashion, where all these things are sort of um, independent actors, and they're all effectively um, looking at the changes that are happening in their environment and taking the appropriate action globally. So in this case, um, there's a relationship between A, service A and service B, but all of the units of A get to see all the units of B, and all the units of B get to see all the units of A, and they can all communicate. So the API that Juju offers to the hooks that people are using and defining for services, uh, uh, for charms, um, is config app to get their configuration, um, unit get to get which we use as a sort of an abstraction around providers specifics, like say, what's my IP address? Um, how, do I, how do I get my storage? All that sort of various things around provider specifics we try to abstract out the unit get. Um, relation list allows you to list out all the, the units of the, uh, the remote service that we might be related to. And then relation get and set uh, allows to, to retrieve settings, <coughs> remote units, or to set our own settings. Juju has a built-in sort of uh, basic security model around network access. Um, the terms themselves will define what ports they want to use, but the administrator after, and then they can do that via open and closed port. And the administrator will then have to go and actually uh, expose the service to actually open up at a provider level what, uh, or whatever the charm is defined as its open network access points. Um, and then Juju log is just a flurry of self-explanatory way of So the high-level charms, effectively, each of them gets, um, well, the normal charms um, all get sort of a, their own machine environment that gets operating in. But we, we, there's also a need for things which are sort of smaller than, which are sort of cross-cutting policy across your service, where I want to have sort of common LDAP authentication, or I want to have monitoring across all my services. And these things we call subordinate charms. They're sort of policy-level things that we might want to do um, across uh, a service or across multiple services. And the major difference, they're defined in the exact same way. They have an additional uh, flag around their metadata at the end that says that they're subordinate. And the primary difference is that they're deployed into the existing unit as opposed to deployed into their own machine resource. We've got some interesting support terms already. Um, we've got them for monitoring, um, for our syslog, um, we have them for Puppet, um, like season others around that same time. Um, and so we also have a cool couple development tools. I realize this is almost unreadable, um, <coughs> but uh, fortunately it was a snapshot. Uh, image. Um, so we have cool development tools and debugging tools around Juju which I think is really important in any distributed system to allow people to figure out what that's going on with it. Um, the first one is debug log, which allows you, which basically aggregates all the logs across all the machines, all of all the agent activity, as well as all the hooks that are being executed, or standard out and standard error, and pulls it back to the client. <coughs> and it also gets some properties uh, from Zookeeper as far as being culturally ordered and uh, uh, so if you're saying you have the same kinds of that give, like, as many different options as far as filtering. Uh, you can filter out on 
particular services, particular units, particular uh, hooks, uh, just to be able to, to, to actually pinpoint exactly where what you want to see. Um, another very interesting one is something called debug hooks. This is sort of, uh, sort of like an interactive debugger. Um, when you call debug hook, when you invoke debug hooks in the command line, it'll actually log you into the machine and set you up in a, to a Tmux um, screen like uh, environment where instead of having the hook executed um, from, from the charm, it'll actually open up a new window inside the, the screen environment. And a lot of you, can, as the administrator, can go ahead and do whatever you need to do. You're, you're basically taking your interaction in that window, in that shell, um, takes the place of the hook. So you can execute the hook, you can edit the hook, do whatever you need to do to, 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 um, to inspect the environment, as well as to figure out what's going on with the system. <coughs> um, it's demo time. I've put some names up here. Um, I'd like to take suggestions from the audience. And what's Subway? Uh, Subway is a Node.js application uh, that does IRC. It's a web IRC client with website. Yeah? Okay. So, I'm running this on my local laptop. Um, I'm just going to deploy Subway. And the, the local environment with the SSD is really fast. It takes just a few seconds to get it rolling. Um, and it's already almost up. I'll go ahead and expose that service. Check to see if it's up. And it's still pending. Let it go. Um, Stats has a few interesting, so. These are all the GG commands that are available. Um, you can uh, most of your self-explanatory begins, uh, hopefully. Um, the general GG terminology again are charms, which you deploy services, um, you have relationships between services, and you have units to a service to capacity. Um, every service uh, has the ability to find hardware constraints against it. Um, once you're ready to use a service, um, publicly or expose it publicly, um, call expose. The, the charm model generally assumes that the type of network for charms to communicate with, um, with it, and as opposed to um, the public access which actually needs to be exposed. And playlist is a straightforward explanatory, and assuming my network's running correctly. Um, go to Subway. Subway's a little boring, I have to admit, because it, it's basically self-contained. Um, <coughs> ah, thank you. All right. Well, where shall we go? Let's go up to Freenode. Version name lookup. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, as far as 
Good morning, three minutes. Uh, idiosyncrasies uh, as a service. Uh, it's, the service is up and running. Um, I say it's boring because it's, you know, it's IRC server, so, um, or gateway, so it's adding capacity to it via adding units or putting in an energy proxy in front of it when it's a web socket connection like, as useful for understanding. Cassandra cluster. Okay, let's go for Cassandra. So Cassandra, I'm not going to do my local laptop. It's, you know, it's Jeff. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll use the same name. So we'll deploy Cassandra with five nodes. Cassandra doesn't have a built in uh, web interface, as far as I know, though. Maybe we should just do a sketch. Um, uh, so I'm trying to think of what is useful to show about Cassandra after we deploy it to actually show it. SSH You can log in and show that the service is running and configure that in Media Wiki. Media Wiki. Okay. Back to the end. service as our DB and we'll stick an entry proxy in front of media wiki so we can oops. and what else? Uh, memcached. Media wiki is kind of cool just because <coughs> Wikipedia is on the you know, top sites on the internet. Is this deploying separate AWS nodes? Yes, each of these is being deployed as a separate AWS node, and then I relate if I can add capacity to any given service to add additional nodes to it. Um, so <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, well, I'm go ahead and export that environment. So that's going to be the environment between light switch. So let's go ahead and add a relationship from MediaWiki to database. Oh, right. So I have to specify an individual one because their MediaWiki can take multiple ones and pools. So it was a slave, then it was a primary right database. You can take multiple what? Sorry? It can, MediaWiki has, can connect to two different MySQLs. The, the single term, it can, it can, a single service can have both mm -hmm. a master database as well as a read slave. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what was that? Just to confuse the unwary. Well, it's pretty clear. I mean, if you try to add a relationship, then it, it won't clearly specify the slave, which yeah, hopefully it would be obvious. But it could be for a memoir. Compared to actually doing it yourself by hand, it's a huge step forward. And crack an HA proxy into media wiki. And then we will add some additional capacity to media wiki. Um, so we have a couple of um, additional tools um, in Juju for uh, visualizing the environment, which we use for demos occasionally. Use GORSE, which is sort of a uh, revision repository, which allows you to uh, revision the repository open GL viewer. Um, but it's a little bit cheesy. But the status command itself has the ability to specify, you can actually specify the output as, uh, as a.
say home open? Uh, it's, it says home open. Okay. It's uh, off the, <coughs> off the uh, screen. So we've got our MiniWiki service, it's running version 3 of the MiniWiki charm. Um, we've added in several units of it. Some of these uh, were not, they're not allocated yet. Uh, MiniWiki 0 is, is available. Um, over here we've got our MemCache service. We haven't related it. Well, it's be a relationship between the two. We've got our database MySQL service. It's given an IP address and we've created our DB relationship to it. And over here, we've got our issue proxy front end to different apps, uh, MediaWiki app servers, and we've connected it to the um, MediaWiki exposed well provided HP endpoint. So, what we're going to do at this point is expose the HP proxy, which we're going to connect to, and use the IP address. Um, any questions while I'm doing the demo? The hardware detection, the machine provider, you mm -hmm. called it. Um, <clears throat> so we saw EWS in your local machine doing uh, LXC. Um, what other ones are available? Yeah, what other ones are available? Like, what if I'm doing like an OpenStack cluster and want to do like all half my drives is JBOD and the other half RAID 10 or something like that? And um, what about different BIOSes and can I do BIOS upgrades and like that? Um, so, Juju has um, roughly four providers right now. Um, we support a uh, local provider, which is the LC mode, EC2, so we were just seeing. Um, we also have uh, something called NAS, which is uh, a product from an event here. First product that allows you to basically do um, that bit of rack and sack sort of setup where you basically treat a, a rack of machines as though they were like a cloud of the park where it'll power them on, install the OS, and make them available to Juju. So it's effectively deploy, using deploy Juju services on the very back. And in fact, Canopel does open stack testing of every single, uh, I guess, every single commit of OpenStack upstream on bare metal hardware using Juju and Mass. Um, we have a set of Juju charms for deploying all the OpenStack services, uh, Keystone, Swift, uh, Node Compute, et cetera. Uh, we also have some experimental ones that we're looking at. Um, well, some experimental ones, some that are about to, to be available. Um, well, they're available. There's not in, uh, not via yeah, yeah. Uh, one is the OpenStack provider. Um, we currently work with OpenStack via the EC2 compatibility API, uh, which is uh, <coughs> novel and interesting, let's say, and not always enabled with various of the public OpenStack clouds that are out there. Uh, HP Cloud enables the EC2 API, <coughs> they don't enable the S3 API for, for Swift storage. Mm -hmm. um, so the OpenStack native providers should be out. Should be out in in trunk and inside the, the package API um, this week, and uh, it's been tested against HP Cloud and the Rackspace OpenStack data that's available, and you can also work against private OpenStack clouds for testing. 
if I wanted to be able to configure um, <coughs> my my hardware, uh, could I do it through Juju or I have to do it through Mass? Uh, I think you'd probably do it through Mass. It's sort of a layer below where Juju plays by nature. Um, we talked about where various ways where we could do that, but like where we have subordinates doing like firmware upgrades and things like that. But it's really at a sort of a machine provider level layer. And there's lots of push armor tools out there that sort of that are coming out there are coming out in uh, functionality. You know, there's there's mass, there's um, there's a razor, there's there's other tools out there that really focus and do well with that problem. Mm -hmm. Like I love management and IPMI, you know, like all that firm air bias upgrades and the whole sort of kit can build. What about going sort of the other direction, top of the rack? Uh, do you do any network reconfiguration, switch reconfiguration? Not the moment. I mean, we're definitely that's probably the next sort of major we're, we're, there's two places we want to go as far as abstracting out some of the idiosyncrasies of a given data center or a cloud provider. Um, those two are network management and storage management. Um, as, far, as far as what, what we do right now, our storage management is fairly, well, it's probably basic. We just, uh, for instance, here we do EBS and for other providers, we just assume there's, there's some storage there. Have you guys started? Not. Hacking on Cinder? Hacking our Cinder. Cinder basically yesterday replaced Nova Volume Manager. Mm -hmm. Nova Volume. Um, the sort of the team decision was made to replace OpenStack's volume management. Um, the old one with the new one. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I couldn't say much about it. Um, so, as far as you know, OpenStack goes in particular, applying, um, so, Juju, so if it's in if it's in OpenStack core, it's part of like um, the next release of Wilson, then there'll be a Juju Charm port and it'll allow you to deploy OpenStack on the bare metal. And then um, you can use Juju to imagine it after all the initial services together, and then you can use Juju to deploy applications on top of your cloud as well. Um, as far as civics of Cinder, I don't know right now. Um, I know we've also been looking capabilities of stuff as you know, sort of live storage would be available for volume management in the open stack environment. Um, so that's like streaming processing store and quite nice. Um, but um, and good performance. Um that's a demo. So So, as far as the uh, charm store, uh, there is actually. I had a question. In that graph, it showed a relationship between HA proxy and mm -hmm. MediaWiki? Yes. I didn't see you define a dependency. How did that happen? Um, you didn't see me define the dependency? The relationship. I, I did it. <coughs> I haven't seen it. I didn't have a relation. Oh, I'm sorry. I must... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did leave Memcast sitting out by itself, but I can add it now and media. Well, so this would be fun to do like an AB test and then add Memcast. Um, but I want to move on to my presentation. Uh, so, but we'll go ahead and add the relationship just for, for giggles. But it, it's actually a very good experiment to actually do performance testing. Just take Memcast out, do an AB test or Siege or whatever your preferred performance testing tool is. And the back end, do the configuration, and see what the different options are that you might like around the service configuration. And the MySQL service configuration um, exposes quite a few things, as well as some sort of higher level tuning. It doesn't directly transport all the thousands of options MySQL has. Um, it also has some 
some uh, higher level parameterization where it defines its own sort of uh, tuning option that you can basically choose for for uh, you know, what, what you would like that sort of abstracts out several so different big values for you. In this case, um, safest, fast, and unsafe, which I guess is rocket speed. Okay, so um, as far as the charm store, um, charms themselves, we have sort of a simple review and QA process. Um, you can contribute them upstream, you can have them local in your organization, and they're, of course, easier to work on. Um, we try to encourage people to, if they're working on an existing charm like MySQL or MediaWiki or Memcache, whatever, to go ahead and try to contribute those changes upstream so that they can be the, that, that value and that service configuration that you have, which you might be an expert around one of these tools and one of these services, can be available to everyone. Um, and that's how we all get better performance <coughs> and collaborate and share and get better services, hopefully. Um, and as far as the actual terms that we have, um, we have a website called uh, Juju Terms. Uh, which has sort of all the charms. Um, if you dig into, if you want to look at the different relationships or see what subordinates are available, um, you can <coughs> any one of these. And it allows you to sort of directly browse what the hooks are for a given charm. And it allows you, allows you to sort of browse the interfaces that are connected to a given interface. So these are all the things that. Um, end up using MySQL, or provide MySQL, which sadly we have many more MySQL users, uh, applications than both for us, but it's a different topic. So, um, yeah, the only options, oh, the experimental one I didn't mention, was the Zorb, which uh, we, they just came out with point support, and we were able to get Gigi up and running on that, and get some demo so that they're Tech ed and launch announcements around that. And we'll need to do some additional ones going forward. And so, one last thing because we have all these providers, we can take a workload that you did on your local laptop and push it out to an EC2 cloud or take out. So, you get tired of EC2. You get better pricing from Rackspace with someone else. And you say, oh, I'm just going to take that my workload from EC2 and I'm just going to go ahead and dump it to whatever to Rackspace. It allows that capability because you sort of have that graph that's available that built that your services and relationships, very easy to take that and export it and put it into a provider. Of course, with the manager data migration, it's a lot, but can't do everything for it. Not yet. Um, and for the future, um, storage management. Um, Cloud federations are cross environment communication and relationships between different things, so we can set up things like remote data sync to a different uh, cloud vendor. Um, same with the REST API, more charms. Uh, the session of stacks, where you know you can have sort of a complex to do setup, but that's just one part of your stack. You go up the stack, or you have like an H base on top of your Hadoop stack, but really it's just one part of your application. And so stacks allow you to do aggregations around services. Where we get to higher level management units. Can you guys manage other resources than like compute right now? Such as? I don't know, like uh, S3 buckets. So, um, charms can do pretty much whatever they want. So, there's a charm out there for ELB, for example, and there's a charm out there for RDS, which allow them to, which basically allow a setup, um, an RDS case setup. Use a sample of MySQL interface, except instead of using a MySQL service, you're really just pointing out to um, Amazon's RDS instance. I'm basically wondering if you could use it as a complete replacement for cloud formation. Um, yeah, definitely. Cloud formation is, well, it it's, hooks into like 30 different Amazon APIs for like 30 different services. Yeah, and I charge you for all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think what Junior does is basically. Obvious need for most of the cloud information, except for Juju doesn't have, um, like, it, it makes it very easy for you to manually scale, but we don't have any built in components into Juju that automatically scale out right now for you. 
based on what, which is one thing that cloud formation does time has available into it. Yeah, you can you can tie it in by hand to an auto scaling group or write a charm that ties it in for you. Yes, absolutely. And I expect that will. Um, so there's there's a lot of innovation that's happening outside of so the core tool itself tries to be fairly agnostic, but there's a lot of innovation that's happening outside of the core tool um, in projects like Jujitsu, which um, has and we have a whole set of uh, you know, a whole bunch of automated testing around charms themselves, where we set up entire service graphs and make sure they all work. And um, I expect there will be something around automated scaling that will be available for people that uses sort of built-in support and level monitoring, like a data feeding into uh, either some sort of stuff again, processing engine that will allow you to, to, to specify auto scaling yourself. But you can also use like I said, charms are free to integrate into, they don't have to use packages, they can grab from source trees, they can use providers of technology as far as getting them into the, um, the uh, so the charm store itself <coughs> is interesting in that, so I've sort of laid out, um, we've built in the notion of what, what PPAs are, so that there's basically personal archives directly within the charm store itself, so there's the official District charms, which are listed here, which are have all been sort of QA through a review process. <coughs> for example, I look for ELB. I see that there's also um, this notion of having personal PBAs that you can directly install from as well. So you can go ahead and push out whatever you want and use it and collaborate with other people around it that may not be in your organization. And still have innovation around inside of the review process per se if you wanted to, or use whatever tooling uh, to provide specific. And these could also get into the distribution itself, the official QA distribution at whatever time you feel or choose to submit them for review. Um, Charm testing across several different providers. Uh, and we actually test out all these charms and want to go to Oh, I sure went that. She must have been great. Well, I'll talk to you about that. Uh, but we do, we, this is normally pretty green, and we do a lot of maintenance testing of these on a per minute basis. Um, or use Launchpad for our project management. Um, I'm going to show you Jiji Terms. We're really, really responsive on IRC, um, and we've got also on the mailing list that's a link on the project website. Um, we have an OSX client. Um, the client itself is fairly portable, um, and we also have an RPM for Fedora, I believe. And that's it. The RPM is just the client? I mean, the management tool? It's just the client. I mean, right now, the client is effectively the server as well. I mean, it's all one code base. Um, but the, as far as what the server needs, um, two things. So the so it, it is event specific right now. Um, and that's not as a consequence of um, the software itself, but a, a consequence of what definitions are. Definitions, definitions themselves are just being executables. I mean, you could use Puppet or Shaft within those definitions, within those charm hooks to try to do abstraction around different um, different uh, providers, sorry, different operating systems. But by themselves, you could also just do that. They can do an app get. So around us having a separate distribution support, it really comes out to having a separate collection of those charms for each distribution. And something else. Oh yeah, CloudNet. Um, again, we use CloudNet to, to initialize the machine. After we help the provider, we pass our configuration data uh, <coughs> to the machine so that CloudNet can actually execute and set up the instance. And CloudNet has to be enabled on the other operating systems. And it is available upstream in Debian now, I believe. And Gigi is also, Gigi Client is also in Debian as well. When you say you use CloudNet um, to configure the node initially, what happens? 
happens if you want to make changes afterwards to the configuration file and things like that? I don't know. So this is where, if you want to sort of more, it's OK, two things. You can do, you can do the as you directly as a station machine. But if you want to have something more on the lines of traditional configuration management, then you can use a, a subordinate term that you deploy to, that you deploy to um, your machines. Uh, tool. You add a relationship between a subordinate service and like Puppet, for example, to the other services that you want to manage with um, in that fashion. Would you, would you generally in your workflow, like you wanted to make changes to like your MySQL config, uh, MySQL is a bad example, but whatever config file, would you tear down those nodes and just extension new ones with the new config? Well, ideally you would modify the charm itself to have that available configuration option. Right. So you want to be tweaking, but you're also available to, it's also free for you to, and then you can plug a new service instead of the data export or whatever. But you can also go in directly to the machine. You doesn't prevent you from going into the machine themselves itself on any given service node to have the files as, as you see fit. <coughs> so, oh, I'm sorry. Does this currently work on Hyacinth? Um, it ru runs with rack space data with the open stack provider. Um, but it's not rack space. Yeah, not the currently general GA. So, uh, this is sort of uh, the end of Brian's question. You're talking about uh, for ongoing configuration management of already deployed machines, what is considered sort of a best practice for Juju? Would you use some other system like Chef or Puppet or something to to maintain those configurations, or do you tear down and spin up new nodes whenever you want to change? Either way. I mean, you have, you have both options. A, you can either have the same options. some sort of uh, relation, like uh, dependency relationship you can set between charms and subordinate charms? Yes. This thing like all of my charms must have the subordinate on the system. <laughs> um, we don't have it by default. Um, that was one of those things that got spec'd out, but for, that you can specify the default subordinates for an entire environment, but never actually happened. Um, so subordinates by themselves, you can add it to any service, in which case all the machines that service. So if you add new machines to that service, they'll automatically have that support and solve it. So I mean that as far as you know, it always being part of that service. So my you know, my app servers always have puppet installed on them, for example, or any support and monitor, whatever. Once you've added that relationship once, any of those any additional capacity you add to that service will always have those supports <coughs> on it. Um, the subordinates themselves can have, especially around monitoring, there's the ability for the subordinates to have more specific, by default, you can add subordinates to anything, and then you get a generic relationship, but they can also get uh, more specific type of like, named relationships um, as far as, like, so they can get that subtraction or uh, my, if I was doing monitoring, they can connect to, like, apply to MySQL, um, they can actually directly connect to MySQL. Do you think this would be appealing on a small scale where, say you have your own project and there's not already a charm built and you're building it yourself, and that might be replacing like bash scripts and just very primitive systems with a, a few nodes? Um, yeah, I think most of, most of our users that are using production don't have, don't really use more than maybe a dozen. Like they're, they're really mostly equal, so production. Okay, most of the users I know that are using production personally are doing web applications, and they just have a few handful of nodes. And, well, I should say that, because there's also the open set users. The open set users tend to have bigger systems. Um, but as far as web applications, there are public sites, for example. There's a site called that is actually running on GG and EC2. Um, and I think they are they didn't really start off for, with like six nodes, and they're down to like two nodes now. Um, but it's definitely 
So there are tools within uh, the Jiu-Jitsu project which allow you to sort of uh, multiplex without any isolation services onto the, the same machine. Um, it's on Encore yet because we want to Encore we want to do it in the proper way where we actually have uh, actual isolation at least on using Alex container between the different services so that we can move them around and have some uh, assurance around the uh, uh, each service having its own free uh, free RAM of a, a machine environment. So you just place uh, a cloud provider per se. But if we start doing the different, then going down the road, we'll just agree that they open the stack per se. Um, and it doesn't necessarily get us get some additional isolation capabilities around store uh, around using real virtualization. But I'm not, I don't think it's really adding a huge amount of value versus actually just using running a private cloud. Do you have an example of a, of a cookbook, a chef cookbook uh, integration into? Uh... I don't really have a chain of chef. We have a couple of public ones. Right. Sorry. Not Juju. 
charter itself, the charter admission. I'm still, this seems like a one-time kind of public-apply kind of thing. Is that what we're talking about? Or will it continue, can you somehow continue to update the know? So, there are two different notions of, of, of using public digit. One is as a subordinate to a traditional puppet master puppet sport, uh, puppet setup where you have the puppet uh, is integrated into the machines via a subordinate charm. And then this usage where eventually the puppet is being used in a headless mode for those being executable that are called out for life cycle events that they're actually doing their work by using the puppet. And so in this case, the hook is setting a bunch of factor values and going ahead and executing the puppet manifest structure. Um, is there any um, attribute or other sort of data core, um, sharing between um, the, say, a puppet subordinate charm and uh, the charms that are driving it? Um, Whereas in this other example, we have the, the charm feeding factor variables, then kicking puppet apply. In this other thing, where you, the sub subordinates being deployed on all the nodes, uh, how are you doing, or are you doing um, data management? You know, feeding puppet anything? I don't know that if they are or not. Um, I think it's subordinate. I mean, it would be easy to feed. Service name and do an external classifier and things like that via the same mechanism to feed data back on the stream. I mean, just a question of, again, with any services, some of, them, some of the charms may not be do everything, but you can see that invitation to <laughs> add it. Because by, making, by adding things to it, it makes it better for everyone. Sure. To, to deploy to mobile devices, you have to create full tolerant services. Do you have any special provisions for the point outside of Well, so Juju, because um, you can set up the, the, the deployment and the relationships and the services in whatever right. fashion you find best for all topics. Um, we don't have direct chain Linux uh, okay. support from Heartbeat all over. Um, Juju itself does have via some of its data properties and, and internal implementation has some notion of availability detection if something goes away and we'll automatically reconfigure the system to, to take, a, take account of that uh, failure. But as far as architecting your application, I should, for example, uh, a media wiki set up mm -hmm. um, with an HA proxy in front of it. I guess there's that HA proxy out for um, ELB, mm -hmm. get rid of the bouncer failure point. And for MySQL, I could add a MySQL slave to it. Um, MySQL charm has slave support and get, and has promotion failure master master slave promotion. So there are part of it depends on what your capture is. Uh, I mean, regardless of any, you know, Juju doesn't magically say right. HAM, but it has capabilities to to allow you to 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 manage whatever technologies that you may have in your architecture. Um, doesn't again doesn't have direct support for for uh, Linux HA or Pizza. What does Zookeeper node do exactly? Um, so Zookeeper gives us, so Zookeeper is pretty cool. Um, what is Zookeeper? Uh, Zookeeper as a database looks like an observable hierarchical file system. It allows you to do, it doesn't provide out of the box much by way of distributed primitives, but it has very, has recipes for doing most of the distributed primitives, um, be it distributed locking, distributed uh, queues, all with uh, all with like player or support and whatnot. Um, we don't tend to. We're actually pretty basic in our usage of Zookeeper as far as what we're doing. We we use the watch observability and the um, the causal the causal order. Ordering, temporal ordering that it typically gives us to events as we see things to allow for the system to be able to know, you know if something joined before something else that you know, we end up that happened in that way order. Um, and as well as uh, as well as the presence and the detection. So everything is just taught. All these things that are connected to Zookeeper have sort of a um, 
a built-in parking connection to on their session to Zookeeper, and so they get swung, get next play, whatever, and it'll be detected. And as that goes away, we we can kind of find out all the to the all the other services that are related. So when nodes are passing attributes to each other, they're passing it through Zookeeper. Yes. Zookeeper as as a database it is a central database. Um, and though I know I stated that the, there was a effectively peer to peer communication, um, the the actual communication is through Zookeeper. And we're definitely we, so Zookeeper has its ups and downs. I mean, we're all <coughs> Council is very big on kind of the two on to the well, we, we publish that on basic uh, things as well. So we're definitely exploring about different storage options. Um, and to keep itself a transport level security of what we're in STM and so it's it's not that great. So we've been actually experimenting with some some work around MongoDB as well to see if we can get any more carefully structuring things out. It's a very different well, MongoDB is consistent um, and it's a fairly different architecture as far as you know, the same primitives that we have to work with. Um, and as far as the you know, I mentioned before that there's a go for it. Um, as far as the charm definition themselves, you know, there's a charm spec, and that spec is all the same charm people in exactly the same. <coughs> What'd you write Juju in? Is it Ruby? Juju is in Python. And then there is a team working on a core to go. What why are you porting it to go? Um because we're at Google. Uh, a couple different reasons. Um, so it's always good for our own. We're, we're building a, uh, a complicated system. Um, how did you learn about it? Go itself as a language is actually pretty nice. Um, having sort of coroutine support baked in as a language level for concurrency is really nice. Uh, as far as what's available in, in Python or even Ruby, like you know, fibers or Greenlands, um, they're they're conceptually nice and they work pretty well, except when they don't. And having a big kind of language level makes that really nice. Um, so having yeah, the first periods are great. The error check. Um, we do a lot of with large teams. Our, our, our Google team, sorry, our uh, our Juju team has grown from you know, two people to let's say fifteen right now. And as we grow the team size. Um, having go really works well as far as um, doing uh, reviews, code reviews, like error checking. So having an extension raised out through multiple call stacks <laughs> or through multiple callbacks, having it immediately see that there was an error, there was an error value that was unchecked in reviews, incredibly useful. Um, so there's different reasons as far as why it, why it would go uh, for a second. Had you guys considered Erlang? We had. Um, Erlang also, so Erlang and Lua are two other languages that have doing a cur uh, coroutine, has it had, both have a coroutine occurrence in all, which done very, very well. Um, Erlang as a syntax is, you know, and kind of as a style, functional style, is really different. And we didn't feel it was, I mean, there would be an answer now. And while Go is new, the adoption is been great. One of the interesting things about picking out fairly new languages that the people in that community are awesome because they're self adopters. They didn't get it because they didn't get into that language because they were you know, going after a job per se, they got into that language because they were curious and interested and motivated. And that's allowed us to pick up some really talented developers. How do you see that migration to go being pulled out? Like time frames and uh, the next know, release. Are you going to support the Python one for a long time? This kind of stuff. Here. So the Python version is released in 1204. That is the third release, I think, of the Python version. Um, being part of it, but it's in the universe. It's, it, it is supported. And there are several, pro the Go port, which is targeted for releasing 1210, um, is only going to support EC2 out of the box. Whereas <coughs> the Python version supports. 
you probably support that in your cloud providers. Uh, so there'll be some current support for your, uh, probably this year um, to get to make sure that um, the Go port has transitioned to feature parity. So there's core feature parity targeted for 12.10, and then the provider feature parity targeted for 13.04. But in theory, the code you write, the terms, the terms are okay. All directly portable. They're, 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 that is not a question. They're, they will definitely be portable or that's a problem. And like for LTS, um, you will support the Python one for <coughs> the full life cycle or do you plan to replace it? Um, so that is a good question. Um, the Python version will probably be supplanted with an export from the LTS. Again, because the actual user definitions and user usage is going to be the same. Okay. What does it matter if the implementation is? I'm just wondering what. Yeah. But I'd say that the Python version is definitely around for this year. Can you speak at all to use of support of Juju on non Ubuntu systems? Um, okay. So, again, the. I did a little bit earlier, but. Uh, the, we need, it needs two things. It needs a separate collection of charms, and it needs cloud init support. Given those two things, it's a fairly straightforward matter. I mean, I mean, like in reality, are you familiar with people using it on? Like, there was, there were some users that had set in patches for Fedora support. Um, where we, they were setting it against the Python version. They're trying to have the way out, kind of getting the, the ports in those patches that were together. Actually, it's not that good, so it actually, they were doing those patches against. Um, and that was to abstract out some of the internal sort of like, you know, the yes, the versus Cisco unit files and the uh, cloud unit uh, to make sure that, that it worked as well for the door. Any other questions? Retired for beer? Trivia questions. Uh, trivia questions. I defer to my colleague, Mark Russell. All right. I think actually, you know, I think I may just skip the mic. I'll just try to be loud enough. Um, kind of messed up uh, trivia questions there because it pretty much all centered around things we just talked about five seconds ago. <laughs> um, did anybody? Uh, have, here's one. Uh, this is for, by the way, for an O'Reilly free uh, ebook. Um, pretty sure that anything on their list. Okay, uh, this one, wow, this one's quick. If anybody caught this, um, the, the Juju project used to have a different name. Does, does Ensemble. Make... Ensemble. You've already got one. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to get the gold book now. Bonus point, do you know what a charm was called? No, it's not. Uh, you have a formula? Damn. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, what Apache project is it due to depend on is not that we just talked five minutes about it. Uh, what is the first command that you would run just before deploy in a Juju environment? Bootstrap. Hey, you know, I should, I should have a rule on calling, but uh, you, got there, you got there first. My hand was in the air, right? So we are going over, um, that's right, the hand was up too. Um, we are going to McKenna's, which is 250 West 14, um, for some drinks. And uh, please, please do come, continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Without reminder.